Hey, you can find your seat this morning. I hope this morning that you're already grateful for descending grace. Mindful that every time we come to God's word, it's a means of his grace to his people. And by the power of the Spirit, a means of conviction, even to those who have yet to trust Christ. And so uh, we pick back up our, our study. Exodus chapter 32 is where we're at this morning. And can you believe it? Worshiping idols. Really? When you find Exodus chapter 32, I found this week an old quote from Billy Graham that I think is relevant to our text. Billy said, a Christian is someone who has turned to God from idols. This past weekend, how many of you have already enjoyed a little bit of the change of the weather? Yeah? How many of you have grilled your first hamburger? Yeah, yesterday I found myself... Uh, in the backyard, got the grill out, put the first burgers on, and took my Bible and started reading through the book of 1 Thessalonians. And I was also reminded this week that before Billy Graham said what he said, that a Christian is someone who's turned from idols, that the Apostle Paul wrote this concerning the church at Thessalonica. He said, For they themselves report concerning us the kind of reception we had among you, and how you turned from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus who delivers us from the wrath to come. So generations before Billy Graham had it right, the apostle Paul had it right. And I'm also reminded today that as we turn to Exodus chapter 32, that throughout centuries that the gospel where Jesus is treasured, idols are crushed. And so this text, which Paul would even say to the church at Corinth in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, stands as a warning to God's people even today. Are you thankful this morning that not only do we find encouragement in God's word, but very regularly we also find warnings? And so this text stands as a warning to God's people centuries later that live right here in Anderson in Madison County. A warning that we should heed carefully, a warning that we should think very deeply about, Because in essence, a lot of times we are very close to even those uh, we find in our text today, the nation of Israel. This text, again, serves as a warning for those, think about where we are. Think about where we've been. They've experienced redeeming grace. How many of us celebrated that God's grace redeemed the people of Israel from bondage in, in Egypt? Right? We saw that. We saw the power of God on display. So we celebrated the fact that God triumphs over Egypt and he sets his people free. So we saw that they experienced that. We've also seen that they've experienced God's provision in the wilderness, that he actually nourished them with bread, and he took care of his people. He has been taking care of his people. And then just recently, we've seen God's glory at Sinai, where God has manifest himself in power, in giving the law, in establishing a covenant relationship with his people. And so we've seen all of that up to this point. We've seen the beauty of God on display in so many ways, and yet when we turn to Exodus chapter 32, can it be true? Can it be true of us that, think about your experience, think about even my experience, that experiencing heartfelt worship one moment and then turning to lesser passions in the very next moment. Making professions of faith with bold declarations of loyalty in one season of life, and then turning to personal pleasure and power and success as your highest ambition in the next season of life. For magnifying Jesus in your private and public life in your 20s to now having barely a recognizable difference in your life in your 30s, 40s, 50s, and beyond. I believe that Exodus chapter 32 should shock our sensibilities the most seemingly mature among us should read this and we should ask ourselves some penetrating questions. Could I be an idolater? Could I be an idolater? The prayer I wrote in my notes this week, both in my journal and in sermon notes, was simply this prayer, Dear Lord, not me, please not me. Jump in with me in verse 1. Exodus 32, when the people saw that Moses delayed to come down from the mountain, the people gathered themselves together to Aaron. The translation doesn't do it justice. There's a sense of vitriol here. There's a sense of anger in the people. They gathered to Aaron and they said to him, Up, up, make us gods who shall go before us. As for this Moses... 
the man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. So Aaron said to them, take off the rings of gold that are in the ears of your wives, your sons, and your daughters, and bring them to me. So all the people took off the rings of gold that were in their ears and brought them to Aaron. And he received the gold from their hand, fashioned it with a graving tool, and made a golden calf or cow or bull. <clears throat> and they said, these are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt? When Aaron saw this, notice he built an altar before it, and Aaron made a proclamation and said, tomorrow shall be a feast to the Lord. They rose up early the next day, offered a burnt offerings, brought peace offerings, and the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Verse 7, And the Lord said to Moses, Go down for your people, for your people, your people, whom you brought up out of the land of Egypt, have corrupted themselves. They have turned aside quickly out of the way that I commanded them. They have made for themselves a golden calf and have worshipped it and sacrificed to it and said, These are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. And the Lord said to Moses, I have seen this people, and behold, it is a stiff-necked people. Now therefore let me alone, that my wrath may burn hot, consume them, that I may consume them in order that I may make a great nation of you. So many definitions of idolatry that are out there, but I think clearly from this passage, we get a description of idolatry, don't we? My attempt at a definition is simply this. It's finding lesser things more seductive, more pleasurable, and more important than what's ultimate, namely God himself. Os Guinness said concerning the subject of idolatry, idolatry may not involve explicit denials of God's existence or character, it may well come in the form of, of an overattachment to something that is in itself perfectly good. An idol can be a physical object, a property, a person, an activity, a role, an institution, a hope, an image, an idea, a pleasure, a hero, anything that can substitute for God. Here we stand on the precipice of those who have seen God's glory, God's faithfulness, God's tenderness, His shepherding love, and yet, in a bold face, twinkling of an eye, they turn from that love and from that devotion. I mean, the slide to idolatry is pretty clear. The description is very vivid. There's a few things that we notice in this first part if we try to think through idolatry and what we see in the text. We see idolatry defined or explained or noted in three different ways. First of all, it's noted in terms of pluralism. One God will not do, right? Right? So Moses delayed, we'll, we'll, we'll come back to that. And notice what the people gather and what they say. They say to Aaron, they say to him, Up, make us gods who shall go before us. As for this Moses, the man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what's become of him. And then Aaron, in fashion of following the lead of the people, requests that of what God had actually provided for them in their plunder of the Egyptians. How odd, how crazy and now it's turned on itself to actually fashion an image of which they would give both loyalty devotion and attention you see one god won't do some would say some scholars would say what aaron's doing here even later on if you notice when aaron saw this look at verse five <clears throat> he says he says when aaron saw this he built an altar before it and aaron made a proclamation and said tomorrow shall be a feast to the lord yahweh it's the exclusive name that that Aaron uses that goes all the way back to what we've already seen of how the name of God. And what some would say is that what, what Aaron is doing is what's called syncretism. He's saying, okay, one God's not a duff, so let's sort of jump into the Egyptian mix. Let's satisfy the heart of the people, and let's give them a lot of options. And what I would suggest to you, as a Christian, there are no options. We believe in the exclusivity of God and Christ and the Spirit, that there is only one God to be worshipped and to be treasured and adored, and his name is Jesus Christ. We see idolatry termed, defined in terms of pluralism. So many people, so many people miss this. They actually live functionally this way that one God will not do. And we see this. We also see a replacement or substituting God for cheap and powerless substitutes. They fashion a golden calf. 
an image. Likely hearkening back to their days in Egypt. But yet what's so interesting is that God has already proven that none of the gods of Egypt have any power. And yet the people here in this moment are substituting God for a cheap replica. A cheap replica. They're making counterfeit deities that they simply trust and put their loyalty in. You think that can happen today? It happens all the time. So many substitutes, but so many substitutes that are hollow and they do not offer what they tell you that they will offer you. You know that. So we see it in the sense of pluralism, one God won't do. We see idolatry in the sense of replacement, substituting God, making counterfeit deities. And then we see it thirdly described as idolatry in the sense of disloyalty. This, this, this turning away from what they had actually previously professed. Notice what happens, what Aaron actually leads them in. It's almost another ceremony of covenant loyalty. But notice Aaron made a proclamation, said, Tomorrow shall be a feast to the Lord. There's this proclamation, there's a feast that goes all the way back to chapter 24, something that's already similar in the making of the covenant. And then notice, and they rose up early the next day and offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings, and the people sat down to eat, drink, and rose up to play. Aaron leads the people in another covenant ceremony of declaring their allegiance to a false god. We see this issue of that they are turning from God to lesser substitutes. But they're turning in the sense of that now they give this idea that they're going to be loyal to a golden calf. It's amazing to me when you think about the depth of betrayal here. It's actually out in the open for all the world to see. One writer said, The holiness of divine covenant making displayed in chapter 24, listen to this, is mocked by the debauchery of human idol making. The miraculous grace of eating and drinking in the presence of the living God is now replaced with play and promiscuity in the presence of a pagan parody. You see, it's very clear when you think about how would you describe, if you're teaching this, how would you describe idolatry from these first six verses? Basically, you could summarize it this way. There's a new allegiance, there's a new direction, and there is a new trust. In essence, all three of the first commandments are already trashed. Already trashed. The NIV translates this, I think, very interestingly. When you look at the slide into sinfulness, Notice they rose up early the next day. They offered burnt offerings, brought peace offerings. Notice this sort of summary statement of what is happening among the people. And the people sat down to eat and to drink, and they rose up to play. The NIV translates that, which I think is helpful, indulged in revelry. The the word is actually broad enough to include even sexual deviance. And it sort of makes sense when you think about this, right? That when you turn away from God... It's very likely that people, and it often happens, turn to promiscuity in all forms of depravity. As a matter of fact, this is the same argument Paul would pick up for the church at Rome in Romans chapter 1. That they substitute the created for the creator. And man has turned in on himself and everything is trashed. So we see that you could think about idolatry in forms of pluralism, replacement, substitution, and disloyalty. Is that our story? Is that your story? Where are you? How does this affect you when you evaluate your life? When you evaluate your exclusive devotion, your passion for Christ, your loyalty to Him? Some observations that I think we can't miss that may save us or even correct us from becoming idolaters that are important in the text. The first thing that we see when you think about observations, how is it that we could either be saved from this or even helped by what we see here? First of all, let me notice sort of the pattern here. Notice the very opening of this text. When the people saw that Moses delayed to come down from the mountain, the people gathered themselves together to Aaron and said to him. One of the things that we see, and I think you can't miss it, is that impatience impatience could actually do us in. But think about this for just a moment. The Bible is very clear that, ex, that, that Moses is gone for about 40, for 40 days. For 40 days. 
And yet, they're so impatient that they have to replace that void with a false god. We often talk about this. Often today, we joke about impatience. But I would suggest to you that our story today shows us the very grim danger of being an impatient person. That in that void, that in that sense of waiting, we can actually gravitate towards wrong things. We can be moved to that which is unhelpful, ungodly. Impatience does them in. It could do us in. Secondly, though, another observation that may help us when it comes to idolatry is that spineless leadership could lead to our demise. Now think about Aaron in this story. I mean, what lame excuses he offers later, right? Spineless leadership. I mean, we see no sense of which Aaron refuses their request. It's almost immediately, right? Now, obviously, it's probably that he was being threatened, right? It, this is probably uh, that there's fear here on his part. But he gives in and gives the people what they want. May I suggest to you that, that courageous leadership is needed in the life of the church, that spineless leadership could lead to the people's demise. Think about it for just a moment. Notice, so Aaron said to them, go ahead, take off the rings. Go ahead and do it, right? Take off the rings, get the gold. They took it off, verse 3, and he received the gold from their hand. And notice what he does. He fashioned it with a graving tool and made a golden calf, and then he presents it to them. He actually is, he is culpable And he teaches us something about leadership, but be careful, be thoughtful. So impatience could lead to our demise. Spineless leadership can lead to our demise. And then thirdly, the appeal of the the seen over the unseen or the tangible over the intangible might ruin us. So here's what I mean by that. Their preoccupation with something that they could understand and see and define was part of their plight. And it is ours today, right? Right? I mean, think about this for just a moment. Give me an image or an idea of God that I can explain rather than a God that boggles my mind. You see, a major contribution to idolatry in this text and elsewhere is the people's inability to actually comprehend the transcendence of God. We don't like our limitations. So we create something more palatable to our own situation, right? So instead of trusting God who has revealed himself in nature, in Christ, in his word, through his spirit, we fashion our own ideologies and idols to worship. Yahweh cannot be made. Idols are human inventions. This is again why Paul would pick up the whole point in Romans 1 that the invisible is exchanged for the visible. You see, we serve a God that boggles our mind, doesn't it? When you think about his nature. And so this is sort of idolatry defined. Well, how does God respond to idol worship? How does God respond to idol worship? This is verses 7 on down. Notice God's response to their rebellion. And the Lord said to Moses, Go down for your people, whom you brought up out of the land of Egypt, have corrupted themselves. They have turned aside quickly out of the way that I commanded them. They have made for themselves a golden calf and have worshipped it and sacrificed to it and said, These are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. And the Lord said to Moses, I have seen this people, and behold, it is a stiff-necked people. Now therefore let me alone that my wrath may burn hot against them and I may consume them in order that I may make a great nation of you. Three things that we see in how God responds quickly to idol worship. First of all, we see that he annuls the relationship in verse 7. This language gives a sense of something is now broken. These are your people, Moses, not mine. One author put it this way pretty shockingly. He said it's sort of akin to that adultery actually happened on the very night of the wedding. And idolatry is so egregious that it severs the relationship and actually proves... That saving faith is exclusive in its orientation. Now, how uncomfortable should this make us feel? I mean, 
Do we read this and say, oh, that's just Old Testament. That's relevant in a day gone by. Or do we actually believe that under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, that God's word is just as relevant today as it was then? That there is a danger here that we cannot gloss over. That there is a seriousness of God's response and there is a threat in this scene. And friend, God is not making a hollow, empty threat. He's not doing this. There is no glossing over this. So first of all, we see that there's the threat of the loss of relationship because of the breach that the, the, the commandments are already being shattered long before Moses would hurl them to the ground. Something has happened of eternal significance, and God is not pleased. God's not pleased. So he annuls the relationship. He gives this sense, this language of like, hey, Moses, these are your people. They are not mine. They're not my people. Secondly, he actually, God, calls them who they are. Verse, notice verse 9. And the Lord said to Moses, I have seen this people, and behold, it is a stiff-necked people. Some of us, in our sensibilities and what we've been taught about God, is that it's just all, God's just fluffy, right? I mean, you literally mean that God calls them a stubborn animal? <laughs> Anyone ever worked with a mule, by the way? This is what God's saying about his people. The image is of, of an animal that stubbornly refuses to turn its head. None of us are stubborn, are we? Right? We're the mature ones, right? We've been in church 30 years. We've got, we can pass the theological test, right? Surely not us. Not, not us, not me. When's the last time you've asked the Lord to teach you something? It's almost as if they enjoy the fruit of being set free from bondage, but now they won't bow to his lordship. Now think about that for man, I love that I'm saved by God's grace. And I have a bright future. But when it comes to actually in humility, recognizing that we're still in need, that we still need to be taught, that we are followers, we love the idea of his saviorship, but we, we get really, really uncomfortable when it comes to his sovereign rule in our life. We like the freedom part. We don't like the kingship part so much. I mean, think about it. They are stubborn people, set in their ways, unwilling to bow to his sovereign rule, but probably thankful for his redeeming grace. You see, I'm convinced that one of the dangers in our hearts towards idolatry is a lack of humility, a lack of being moldable, of actually saying, you know what? I, I screw up. I, I still need his rule in my life. And I need to follow him. He calls them a stiff-necked people. So first of all, the danger of the relationship, the annulment, he calls them who they are. And then thirdly, he threatens to annihilate them and actually carries it out. Notice, there's this sense of which Moses is already standing in the gap, right? Notice verse 9, interesting. The Lord said to Moses, I've seen this people. Behold, it's a stiff-necked people. Now notice verse 10. Now, therefore, let me alone, Moses, interesting, <laughs> that my wrath may burn hot against them and I may consume them in order that I may make a great nation of you. So he actually threatens. And then verses 25 through 29, you can read it later, the Levites strap on the sword and they actually under the authorization of Moses, kill those who are guilty. 
Later on at the end of the chapter, there's a plague. Notice verse 35. So we see in verses 25 through 29, the execution of justice. Right? Moses saw that the people had broken loose in verse 25 to the derision of their enemies. Then Moses stood in the gate of the camp. Just pick that up, verse 26. Who is on the Lord's side? Come to me. And all the sons of Levi gathered around him. And he said to them, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, Put your sword on your side, each of you, and go out to and fro from the gate and to the gate throughout the camp, and each of you kill his brother and his companion and his neighbor. And the sons of Levi did according to the word of Moses. And that day the 3,000 men of the people fell. And Moses said, quote, Today you have been ordained for the service of the Lord, each one of you, at the cost of his son of his brother, so that he might bestow a blessing upon you this day. And then verse 35, Then the Lord sent a plague on the people because they made the calf, the one that Aaron made. Is God unjust? So do we cut this out of our Bible and just say, this is unfair? No. There's something happening here that we cannot give up. It's a terrifying reality to deny him, to to substitute him for anything. You see, God's judgment then, now, and in the future is not, as some popular people will try to teach you, It's not some sadistic, vengeful act on the part of an evil tyrant. But rather, it's a consistent and equitable response towards rebellious idolatry. His action of judgment is fair and unquestionably consistent with his character and promises. One writer said, The Bible is full of of acts of God's judgment. The fall, the flood, Babel, Sodom and Gomorrah, Pharaoh and the Red Sea, The death of the first generation in the wilderness, the Passover lamb, the death of Christ on the cross, the eternal lake of fire. Judgment is all over the Bible. And just because it stuns our our modern sensibilities does not mean that we can give it up. Friend, let me ask you, if you give it up, then what is your position of the cross? It magnifies what happened on Calvary. It lays us low. He threatens and executes justice. So how does Moses respond? We see how God responds, but how does Moses respond? Go back earlier. Notice how Moses responds. We begin to see light in the midst of judgment. Moses implored the Lord his God and said, O Lord, why does your wrath burn hot against your people? whom you have brought out of the land of Egypt with great power and with a mighty hand? Why should the Egyptians say with evil intent, did he bring them out to kill them in the mountains and to consume them from the face of the earth? Turn from your burning anger and relent from this disaster against your people. Verse 13, remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, your servants, to whom you swore by yourself and said to them, I will multiply your offspring as the stars of the heaven and of the land that I have promised I will give to your offspring, and they shall inherit it forever. And the Lord relented from the disaster that he had spoken of bringing on his people. Then Moses turned and went down from the mountain with the two tablets of the testimony in his hand, tablets that were written on both sides, on the front and on the back, they were written. The tablets were the work of God, and the writing was the writing of God, engraved on the tablets. When Joshua heard the noise of the people as they shouted, he said to Moses, there's a noise of war in the camp. But he said, it's not the sound of shouting for victory or the sound of the cry of defeat, but the sound of singing that I hear. And as soon as he came near the camp and saw the calf and the dancing, now notice the symmetry between God's response and now Moses. Moses' anger burned hot and he threw the tablets out of his hand and broke them at the foot of the mountain. He took the calf that they had made and burned it with fire and ground it into a powder and scattered it on the water and made the people of Israel drink it. We see so many things here about Moses, but let me just try to summarize a few. First of all, we see that Moses acts as a great intercessor and he appeals to God on three fronts. Are you thankful for the picture of Moses that we see in this? And from verses 11 through 14, there's three appeals that, that Moses makes to the Father. He appeals to past grace, right? Verse 11, that God, you have brought them out of Egypt, so relent from this, right? You've brought them out. He appeals to God's credibility among the world, 
That the, notice verse 12, why would the Egyptians say with an evil intent you did this? You brought them out, then you killed them in the desert? Doesn't make sense. So he appeals to past grace, he appeals to God's credibility, and he appeals to the prior promise to Abraham. One of the things that we see that's so important in this story of idolatry is that someone stands in the gap for idolaters. Hallelujah. <laughs> what, a sa- what a leader. Now, think about the, the, the leadership instincts of Moses compared to Aaron at this point. Moses acts as, as, a, as a means of grace for the people by pleading to the Lord that God would not destroy the people, that he would change his course, that he would not, that threat would not be realized to its full extent. Key part. <laughs> Moses acts as a great intercessor. Now, there's a lot here, but we're going to keep diving through this. There's, a, there's an observation that you need to make. Let me ask this question. Moses prays. He implores the Lord. Does prayer change things? Yes and no. Yes and no. You see, what's brought up here, because we see God actually, verse 14, and the Lord relented from the disaster that he had spoken of bringing. Not that he doesn't execute justice, but they're not all consumed. But something's happening here. That it, we see the importance of prayer, but yet we also see that God is in control. The tension between God's sovereignty and man's responsibility. D.A. Carson said, rightly, there is a razor edge between God's sovereignty and man's responsibility, our prayers. A razor edge. You see, if we deny God's sovereignty, his superintendence over every molecule... Where Jesus said, not a bird falls to the ground apart from your father. But even the hairs of your head are numbered. We commit a tragic error regarding the character of God. But if we deny the believer's responsibility to actually intercede and pray, pray this way, our father who art in heaven, we commit an equal error of terrible disobedience. I would simply say this. How does this work itself out? How how does this work itself out? We have to understand that God has ordained both the ends and the means. But this is why prayer matters, isn't it? Prayer is actually how the things that we see happen, right? So when we pray, how are things that are eternally ordained brought into reality? It is through our prayers that should blow our mind. Some think that God is bound to relent to our request. But that's not true. He is only bound to his exclusive plan. So there's a danger here. Some can move towards open theism. Future's open. God's removed from history. He doesn't know the future. He hasn't planned it. And and what happens is, is we become the primary actor in the story. In essence, in that position, God becomes a lesser God and we become the sovereign. This is not true. God uses the prayers of his people to bring about his plans. How mind-blowing is that? So here's the application, though. Don't miss the power of intercession in what we see in Moses. How is this text relevant for us today? How is this so important? The psalmist would say about this episode in Psalm 106, verse 23, therefore he said he, that's Yahweh, would destroy them, had not... Moses, his chosen one, stood in the breach before him to turn away his wrath from destroying them. So do prayers change things? Absolutely. Absolutely. Is God obligated to do what we ask? Absolutely not. He is God. I'm not. The tension there should cause us to really consider things. But let me ask you this question about Moses and about us when we think about idolatry, when we think about intercession, who are you praying for? Who are you standing in the gap for? Augustine said of his own mother that she labored more in prayer for his spiritual birth than his childbirth. So the big question is not to get it tied up into knots into the theological sort of tension. The question is, is Again, as a church and as a person, who are you standing in the gap for? Who are you pleading for? Parents, are you praying for the salvation of your children? 
Are you asking God to save your kids? Or if we can just get them in the right church, in the best schools, and they get a good education, they get a good job, and they become really good moral agents in this community, and yet they die lost. Do we feel that we've done our job? Moses hears the threat of God. And he implores the Lord. Moses, secondly, acts as an agent of discipline and correction. Quickly. Not only does he act as a great intercessor, but he acts as an agent of discipline. Verses 15 through 24. Can you imagine Moses smashes the tablets when he comes down from the mountain? How many church search committees would, like when they read that about Moses' leadership, would say, no, that guy's too angry? Right? I, can you? No, we need a nice guy. We need no, someone who actually is upset over sinfulness and idolatry. He just doesn't get it. We we want a leader who pacifies our idolatry, not as upset at our idolatry. Let, let's find those type of guys. Let's find those type of churches. It's amazing to me that Moses, in justified anger, smashes the tablets in public disgust. Moral and religious outrage. So is there any sense in me, in you, of any sense of moral outrage when we're okay with idolatry from those who profess to love Jesus? Moses has a different take. He destroys the golden calf, and then he has the audacity to crush it, pulverize it, And actually throw it on the water and make them drink it. I mean, this guy would, there is no way he's getting a job. I mean, serious. Like, no. I mean, that kind of leadership, no way. No way. Increasingly so in the West, Moses' opportunity for a job, falling away. (laughs) Falling away. I mean, this act of them swallowing it was akin to what Moses is saying, okay, you, you're guilty here. You're going to own all of this. Not only does he do that, but then he confronts Aaron. I know, I mean, his whole confrontation of Aaron is pretty instructive. And you can go back and read it. It's pretty lame, right? Moses confronts Aaron. Just show, you, you can look, verse 21. We got to see this. I know it's late. What time is it? <laughs> We're good. Yeah, okay. Yeah. All right, but no, thank you. For the visitors, please come back next week. Um, seriously, though, that there's but notice what he does. He's acting as an agent of correction. He's acting as uh, somewhat of a prophet here. He said to Aaron, "What did this people do to you that you have brought such a great sin upon them?" I mean, the culpability here, the the prophetic word of actually telling someone they're at fault. What leadership? What, what, what understanding of, of moral responsibility and religious responsibility? And Aaron said to him, notice Aaron, here we go, and here's another leader for you. Aaron said to him, let not the anger of my Lord burn hot, right? Don't get upset at me. You know the people that they're set on evil. Completely av- avoids responsibility, Right? Here's a leader who's like, that's not my fault. You know them. I mean, that's, it's their fault. So he voice, and then, and then notice what else he says. I love this. For they said to me, verse 23, make us gods, plural, who shall go before us as for this, this Moses, the man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt. We don't know what's become of him. So it's amazing. Not only does he say, okay, this is your people. Now he says, okay, It's your fault, Moses. It's your fault. Completely avoids the whole thing. Leaders that avoid responsibility and tell half-truths are dangerous and they lead people into demise. Aaron is not worth following. Moses shows us a different picture. Then Moses authorizes the execution of the guilty. We see Moses act as an agent of discipline. Lastly, we see Moses act in humble solidarity with his rebellious family. Quickly notice, what does Moses do here? So much gospel light here. 
So much gospel light. Notice, then the next day Moses said to the people, you have sinned a great sin, and now, and now I'll go up to the Lord. Perhaps I can make atonement for your sin. What hope do they have? Moses returned to the Lord and said, Alas, this people has sinned a great sin. They've made for themselves gods of gold. Verse 32, But now if you will forgive their sin, but if not, please blot me out of your book that you have written. But the Lord said to Moses, Whoever has sinned against me, I will blot out of my book. But now go, lead the people to the place about which I have spoken to you. Behold, my angels shall go before you. Nevertheless, in the day when I visit, I will visit their sin upon them. Then the Lord sent a plague on the people because they made a calf. The one that Aaron made, verse chapter 33, the Lord said to Moses, Depart, go up from here, you and the people whom you have brought up out of the land of Egypt, to the land which I swore to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Still see the grace here? Do you see the grace? To your offspring, I will give it. I will send an angel before you, and I will drive out the Canaanites, the Amorites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, the Jebusites. Go up to a land flowing with milk and honey, but I will not go up among you, lest I consume you on the way, for you are a stiff-necked people. In essence, what we see is Moses is acting in solidarity with the people Moses, in essence, is saying to the Lord, don't wipe them out. Don't remove your promise from Israel and give it to me. Don't do that. I would rather die than to see this promise fail. What a leader. You see, the consequences of idolatry are pretty clear in all of this. Sinfulness consumes us. Judgment threatens us. And then what we see here is that God's presence withdraws from us. Think about this. A tent now without glory. And a promise without his presence. The consequences of our idolatry are endless. But what's the hope? I think the hope, the shadow is seen in Moses. We need someone to lead us, don't we? Moses, Aaron, Jesus, we need a greater leader. Do you realize that we need someone to intercede for us? To stand daily pleading our case, Romans 8, 34? That we need someone to die for us? To stand in our place when Jesus said it is finished so that we could live? And we need someone to offer us eternal forgiveness. Jesus said, Father, forgive them. For they know not what they do. Here's the summary. Jesus Christ is the only shepherd who leads his people rightly. He is the only high priest who intercedes with eternal power. He is the only perfect atoning sacrifice worthy to die for idolaters. And he is the only sovereign. Please hear me. He is the only sovereign who offers forgiveness eternally for idolaters. Jesus Christ, shadowed in Moses, is the way that this is resolved. It's the way that this resolved. The answer to idolatry is the transformative good news of Jesus Christ. It is not a, it is not a better Bible study, and I love Bible studies. It is not a better church service or experience. It is not about getting what all of those things. The only answer... To your idolatry, the only answer to a heart that is prone to wonder and leave is the transforming grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the one who leads us better than Moses. He is the one who pleads our case before the Father as Moses stood before the Father right now in heaven. Think about the beauty of this. The Son of God pleading the case before the Father on the behalf of sons and daughters. He is the only answer to idolatry. And Jesus Christ is the only one who forgives us of idolatry. And furthermore, he is the only one who gives us the power to crush idols. I wonder, I wonder, in this room and in this heart, are there any idols? Are there any loves that are higher than Jesus? 
then by his grace, may they be crushed. Right now, in this room, in this moment, in our response, may they be crushed. Let's pray. God, thank you. Thank you for the picture that we see. Father, we do, I do, feel so inadequate. But yet, God, I'm reminded that your word is enough. That your word works. In spite of all of our mistakes, our missteps, our errors, and all of our struggles, Lord, that your word works. God, it's my hope in my own life this morning Dear Lord, not me. Please, Lord, not me. God, forgive us. Forgive us. We look to Jesus who intercedes for us, who pleads our case. We look to Jesus who died for us. And we look to Jesus who offers us eternal forgiveness. God, would you crush our idols this morning? Please crush our idols. May we not live under the threat, but may we live under your grace. God, do that, please, this morning. In Jesus' name, amen.